Stallion, why should I come to the Passive Income Retreat in Denver, Colorado this October? You should come to this retreat if you're saying to yourself right now, I need passive income to come from my active income. If you're the person in your circle that is the most successful and you have nowhere else to go, and all those passive income ideas seem very elusive, but you know in reality, you've never slowed down to actually figure it out. Yeah, I'm saying, man, you must come if missing out on another summer, right? Like when you think about how many summers you have left with your kids and you're like, how many more summers can I afford to miss because I am burning 60 to 80 hours a week in my job, regardless of how much money you make, your family doesn't care. They want time with you. These opportunities, they're giving you an opportunity to, to sit in a room with eight and nine figure entrepreneurs so that you can figure out how to create financial freedom that exceeds your monthly expenses is what this event's about. Don't miss the opportunity to come to Denver, Colorado, be with the Stallion I and about 50 to 60 other highly successful entrepreneurs like yourself, go to the Passive Income Retreat.com and sign up right now. Limited spots available. As you sit there and listen to this podcast episode, it's a little bit different than our normal one. Not just just an investor story, not just the entrepreneurial story. It's all of that combined with a little bit deeper connection to how do we see ourselves utilizing the dollars that we have to fulfill the values that we've set for ourselves. And maybe you haven't actually set those for yourself in this episode is going to maybe challenge you on that. And I, I think that so many times we can be so discontent with the amount of blessings that we have in our life, right? Sometimes we, it takes when things go bad for us to start to wonder, what should I do next? And while we're pursuing financial freedom, I don't want it to be lost, Stallion, that we also need to be focusing on how do we connect what we want to do with purpose. Well, and I think I think it's even bigger than that, Russ. It's that, you know, there's financial freedom and there's spiritual freedom. When those things are aligned, yeah, Stephen Libman, our guest today, talks about how there's true fulfillment behind that. And at the end of the day, you're listening to this podcast not just because you want to see dollars coming into your mailbox without you having to go to work. That's great. But ultimately, what's behind that, the why behind the why behind the why, is I want fulfillment, right? I want to be satisfied. There's something that is ultimately kind of missing or there's a gaping hole. And I'm just going to tell you, I think Stephen Libman crushed it today. He helped us to put words to that feeling that we have. And we talked about some so three main points I think you're going to walk away with today. One, what are your core values? Two, how do you steward those good gifts that you've been given? And three, how do you connect your investments to match your plan and your options? I, I think it kind of says it for yourself. How do you invest with purpose? Let's get right down to it here with Stephen Lib. Welcome to the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast your guide to understanding how to get out of the Wall Street rat race and start your own mailbox money lifestyle. Now, don't let these handsome Southern draws fool you. These financial minds are teaching our country to enhance savings, increase cash flow, and create passive income, all without the help of Wall Street. Are you ready to break through? Now here are your hosts, Russ Morgan and Joey Murray. Welcome in tribe. Today, you're going to learn what it looks like to invest with purpose with our good friend, Stephen Libin and Passive Income Mastermind member. Stephen, so glad to have you, my friend. Yes. I love coming back and seeing your beautiful faces. <laughs> At least mine. Hey, right. <laughs> well, faith in finance is something that we're going to be breaking down today. If you struggle um, with, with really understanding how do you take the, the gifts, the talents that you've been given and steward them well, know where to put them, make sure they're connecting to the things that you want to do. Today's podcast is what you want to listen to. And Stephen, man, I, I've been watching you for a long time uh, give and give gratefully and generously. But for those people who don't know much about your background, if you haven't listened to episode 95 where Stephen talked about how to become recession resistant by investing in self-storage or the last episode just two years ago where he was talking about why it's more important to get return 
of your investment than return on your investment. You need to go listen to those. So Steven, tell me why you changed the name of the company to Investing with Purpose from Integrity Holding. Yeah, so it's really just a DBA, but I think it tells the story better, right? Because what we're doing is we're more focused on um, the why. So what's our why? And we know real estate is the what. That's the vehicle, but what's the why? And for us, you know, we want to, we're Christian owned and operated company. Um, not every one of our uh, employees is, but Travis and I, who are the owners are. And giving and giving abundantly to help grow the kingdom and save souls and to tell people the good news and the love on people around the world is really the mission of what the business is doing. So the real estate is the what, but that's really the why. So we really wanted to put that out there front and center and have people recognize like, hey, these guys are investing with purpose, meaning there's something else behind that. And maybe those people want to do that as well. So through some prayers, like just do 1% of the next deal. And that was it. We started with one, we're a tithing company. So we give 10% back to uh, the church, but then 1% past that the tithe was what we started. It was like 2,500 bucks that first year that we did it. Um, <clears throat> the next deal, we did 2%. The next deal, we did 4%. The next deal, we did 7.5%, I think. And the last deal we sold was... 13% of our company proceeds past the tithe was given away. And that was a $60 million exit. So it, we're just trying to continue to grow in every year and every deal that we do. And we, you know, I, we like to give till it hurts. So out of the profits, like we know we need to make more to give more. Um, the goal of the BHAG is to reverse tithe at some point, right? And live off of the 10 and give 90. So you say invest with purpose. And for some of us that are, like you, you mentioned, followers of Christ, right? Call yourself Christian. That that purpose is maybe easier for us to, to envision. But for those who maybe have not grown up in a house or know, know Christ personally, and they're trying to figure out how to give with purpose. How, I'm sure you have these conversations. I'm sure you, you go to a lot of these events and people ask you, man, investing with purpose, how do you help them connect those dots? So it's amazing that it took this happening in business for me to apply it to the rest of my life, but that's exactly what happened. We had hired a coach and they came in and they said, okay, you guys have to write your mission statement. Okay, so we did a company mission statement. From there, you have to come up with your core values. And so now we have a family mission statement as well and a family core value set. And then we have our business and they're very closely aligned. But um, getting to your core values and really understanding why you do what you do. What's the driver, right? There's the seven layers of why. It's like, well, I want to create passive income. Why? I want to be home with my family more. Why? Well, my dad left when I was three and I want to be a present father. Cool. Why? Right? You keep going down and you start to really understand what your why and what your purpose is. And it's a good exercise. And do this with your wife or your spouse or your business partner if you have one. But you can sit down right by yourself and throw, throw down some things like, what do I value? Ask yourself those seven layers of why and really come up with four or five things that are your core tenets, your core values. And then align that with, and when I say that, I mean align you're everything with those things, right? We tell our employees when they get hired, hey, we hire, fire, promote, and demote on these five core values, right? Everything that we do is based on these five core values. Same thing, kids, they know these are our core values, like a violation, can't kick kids out of the family, but you know that you, you, Wait, you can't be fired if you violate okay. the core value. Um, <clears throat> so I think it's important for people to just sit down and, and go through that exercise and create those core values and then align, make sure that you're, interests are aligned with those values, meaning your investments, meaning where you're spending your money, where you're spending your time, where you're, you know, where your time, effort, and energy goes should align with those core values. Okay. But it's easy for me to move past that and just say, oh, that sounds good. What is the actual result of doing that? Right. Why you, you want to ask why, 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 why? I'm going to ask you, why is it important for those things to happen? What, what was the result for you? Simply fulfillment. I think people are seeking it in many different ways, but when you align all aspects of your life with your core values, you truly become fulfilled, right? And you you know that you're living on purpose, not just investing with purpose, but everything's on purpose. Can I, I'm going to, so Russ, you might not uh, 
you might want to chime in here too, but I'm going to, I'm going to say something that I think aligns with what you're talking about here, Stephen, and that is how many of us have actually stopped and thought about why there seems to be some sort of friction in our lives. And it may not be something that you have necessarily put your, your finger on or your thumb on. It's that man, especially as a believer, okay, I'm going to just throw this out as a believer, we may be doing things like we have this, this set of beliefs and these core values that we live by that, that we have experienced grace and mercy through our relationship with Christ. And, but yet we may be living parts of our lives that are necess- that are not necessarily fully aligned with that. Now, I'm going to give the example, just since we're talking about investing, um, and because we hate Wall Street, I'll just throw that out there as well. Um, w- if we are consistently putting money into things, uh, i.e. a 401k or IRA or something like that, because we don't know any better, we could be simultaneously putting money into things that go directly against what we believe, but it's just happening on like this autopilot, like underneath our nose. And it's not even connected again with our bigger values. Like, like you said, I want to be financially free. I want to have passive income. I want to spend more time with my kids because, because, because all these things, those are the things that should be driving our decisions, but we have somehow kind of differentiated my investing from the rest of my Christian life, let's say. And what I love about what you're saying is those things create a lot more fulfillment when they're aligned. So oh, yes. sp- speak to that. What, Russ, what would you add to that? Well, I, if it's okay, I want to give you some context for this talk. I think it, it'd be easier for us to stay together. What if we start off, you talked about your core values, like what those are. And I, for you, you went through a process in order to come up with those. And I'd love for you to kind of share that process with us so that if we haven't done that, that's something we could sit down and do, then I think we can get into maybe how do we steward the resources? And then lastly, what you're asking there, Joey, is how do we connect our investments, what we're actually doing to those core values, to our stewardship, so that way we know that they are aligned. So what would you say is the, the process that you went through, or how would you encourage us as we listen to this to, to come about creating our own core values? Yeah. So think of people that you really respect in your life um, or look up to, or maybe not even in your life, maybe historical figures, whoever the superhero is for you. Right. And write down some of the qualities that you, that you love about those people, right? Pick two or three or four people and then write down some of the qualities that you love about those people. What's interesting about core values is you don't see what you like in other people because you long to have it. I believe it's because God already placed that in you. So what you're recognizing is the embodiment of what is already inside of you that you really love, right? That you really respect, that you really honor. And so that's the easy way to do it is to look at other people that are in your life or historical figures, again, like whatever the superhero is, and then say, what are the, like, you know, did this exercise with somebody and they, they said, you know, bravery is, you know, my dad is so brave, right? And little kids, I had, I teach an entrepreneurship class at homeschool co-op. So all these homeschoolers sit in t- and we're first class core values, right? And amazing how many people don't do this later on in life. I got these 14 year old kids going. You know, I, m- my mom is strong-willed. My dad is really brave and honoring, uh, honest. We're writing all these things down, and I'm like, okay, so now you can only pick five. So go through, and you probably named a couple of the same attributes over a couple of different people, so you can cross those out, you know, and just circle one of them, and then go see where the overlap is, because those are the things that are really hitting home for you. So that's a pretty easy exercise to do. And then I would encourage you, if you're going to do this, right, and write all these things down, these people down, um, send that letter to them. Dear so-and-so, I just want to let you know that it's coming out of my core values, and this thing really rang true for me and how much I respect you about this thing. It'll it'll bless them, and it'll be a fun exercise. But I think that's a, a quick, easy way to do it, where you just sit down and list off qualities that you respect 
And, and who all was involved in that process of creating the core values? Well, so for the family core values, my wife and I, and for the business core values, everybody. We sat around an entire room, right? The visionary has to make the final call, but we got input from everybody, right? Like, so our first core value is Christ-centeredness, and we understand that we're not going to only hire Christians, but you need to act in accordance with the values that Christ would present, right? So if you're outside of Christ's likeness in terms of not acting with integrity or honor or whatever, then that's where you, that you would violate that core value. And then, um, you know, re respect, everybody deserves respect. So that came up a few times in, in that process. So yeah, if you're a business owner, do it with your team. If you haven't created company core values yet, and the visionary has to make the final call, though, right? So like my wife's, uh, one of her core values was smart. I didn't even know smart could be a core value, but like it's a core value for her. Meaning she doesn't have any friends that like are dummies, right? She needs smart at <laughs> core value because it like it gets under her skin that she can't have an intelligent conversation with somebody. So like it became right. a core value. So now it's a core. Is value. this why I've not met your wife yet? <laughs> <laughs> this is this is hard for me to hear. <laughs> she has declined every one of our mastermind leading conversations. <laughs> <It's my interest. laughs> uh, so I don't. I don't know about this. So, so obvious. And you, you talked about creating the core values. Well, one, I, just taking those, tribe as a business owner, creating core values for the business is what Stephen says, is that it allows him to operate the business based upon those core values. So it's so hard sometimes when we're, we have team members that maybe don't seem to be measuring up and we struggle to communicate why to them because we don't have a measuring stick. Well, if your measuring stick is all over the place, it really messes things up. But right here, if you have five core values and the person, you know, lied about something, right? And you say one of our core values is integrity, clearly lying, regardless of, of what background is, we can we could say lying doesn't meet the core value of integrity. Now, yep. in our family, we actually sat down, Stephen, we actually included the kid all the way down to my youngest, which he was, I believe, eight at the time that we did this. We all created our own list of core values. And then and then we, we we had those. So there was the six of us and we all came up with five. And some of them were the same, some of them weren't. But then then we had to vote to see how to like what were the five for us. So it really it forced us to go through and our, our five were creativity, experience, faith, generosity, and loyalty. Um, you know, thankfully, you know, smart was not in that group for me. <laughs> but I, I do think it's so valuable to get people involved. I love the fact that you got your team involved because that helps make the team uh, move there. Well, and what it does further than that is it sets the expectation. Now we're all in agreement that these are, right? I think frustration is born out of expectations not meeting up with reality. So expectations is the only one of those things that we can control. So setting the expectation of, hey, we hire, fire, promote, and demote on these core values. What it also does is give them a level of comfort that like, hey, if you screw something up, but you haven't violated a core value, that's not a fireable offense, right? It's a violation of core values that makes it a fireable offense, not that you screw up. We all screw up, right? If you hide the fact that you screwed up, maybe you violated a core value, right? And that's a different conversation. But I think it, it does a really good baseline of setting expectations with everybody and getting everybody on the same page. Yeah. So perfection is not a core value. Humility <laughs> it might be, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And humility is one of ours. I love that. All right. So let, let's talk about then the second step to this. How how do you manage resources? How do, how do you pre uh, be a good steward in light of the core values that you and your family have set? Yeah. So I love one of my favorite stories in the Bible is the parable of the talents. And I think that there is this misconception in the Christian world or church or, you know, previous ideas that you have to be poor to, to be a Christian. Right. You have to give up. There's one story in the Bible that says, give all of your belongings and follow me. And people took that quite literally. But Parable of the Talents is one of my favorite ones because the guy who just goes and buries the talent and doesn't create a return on investment, the master comes back and says, give me that. You're not worthy of having it. He actually calls him a couple choice names where it's like, oof, I don't want to hear that from the master. The second guy, he made a slight return, which was good. He was happy with him. And then the, the guy who 
went out and invested it and made a lot more with it. They took from the other guys and gave it all to him. So stewardship in that story is, is really important to God or in that story of the master. And, you know, I think we need to understand that when we're given resources, one, you know, it's your responsibility to steward it well. And what that means is to multiply it, not just add to it, but multiply it. So in what ways are we doing that? And then in what ways are we being generous, right? The, lo the Lord loves a cheerful giver. So how can we continue to give more abundantly and more abundantly and more abundantly? Well, you have to multiply resources if you're going to be able to do that, right? So those two things, I think, have historically been disconnected. But we believe that they're intrinsically linked. The more money that we make, the more we can give, the more impact that we can make, right? I know that I wasn't called to go be a missionary on the front lines and digging wells in Africa, but God gave me a gift of business and stewardship in the way that we can go and write the checks for the people that are on the front lines, right? So it's um, whenever we make a decision about where we're going to spend money, we try to, and this is not, you know, this isn't like a hard and fast rule, like, hey, you can't do this because it goes against your Christian worldview. It's just, are we mindful of it? And I don't think a lot of times we are, right? We're trying to figure out how do we multiply, but are we multiplying? I mean, the, the Bible also says that it, you shouldn't um, take part in any profit that profits from wickedness, right? So I'll look up the scripture on it, but it's something to the effect of like, don't, don't have any part of um, like non-godly deeds or ungodly deeds. Okay, so when we make a decision to invest in something, is that person aligned with our core values, number one? Is the investment aligned with the core values, number two? And will it give me the best rate of return on my capital so that we can continue to fund more core value-driven things? And, um, you know, so when we're stewarding I mean, we, and we steward not just other people's money that invest with us, right? But we're stewarding the tenants. We have over, you know, 980 families on one property, right? So we're talking about thousands of families uh, around the country that we are stewarding the property for them as well. So like when we hear bad reports about one thing, like we want to make sure that we're trying to fix it as best we can, not just for the rate of retirement, but there's people, there's human beings living there. We partner with a company called Apartment Life, where we actually have, uh, we give an apartment in all the complexes that we uh, that we own for somebody to come in and live there for free. And they work locally, but they're there to create culture and create community and love on people. Single mom comes home from the hospital with a baby. She goes and drops off diapers and wipes and maybe a $25 laundry gift card or something. So they, you know, the first couple of weeks of transition aren't as brutal as bringing home a baby is when you're a single mom that week, right? We're doing movies under the stars and letting the kids come out and watch Shrek in the courtyard, like just little things, right? But they add up to create that community because that aligns with our core values. So I think when we're thinking through how am I investing and where is my money going and okay, so what makes the master say, well done, good and faithful servant. You, now I'm going to give you all the money to go do stuff with because it's been done. It's been dealt with really well. How are those things all intersecting? Well, I, that's exactly the word that was coming to my mind was that you're you're intersecting where those core values then lead to how you're going to steward them well. And I think leading to the last point is connecting those same investments to match your plan and to match your core values. So talk a little bit about like your experience um, that may has that may have driven you to this point of where do you give and how do you decide who you're going to give to and stuff like that along with some of the ways that people who have invested with you have woken up to the idea that maybe where they were investing wasn't aligned with their ultimate core values yeah i think the aha moment for me was it could be both Right. It can, we can do both things, which is leave in a, a legacy that we want to leave for our kids, but also build an eternal legacy in heaven by, by funding nonprofits around the world. And like I said, that first year we gave like 2,500 bucks. Last year we funded over 28 um, different nonprofits around the, the world and impacted over 230,000 lives through that giving. Right. And then, 
it's interesting because every time I say 230,000, I feel like it's such a big number that it almost gets lost in how impactful it is, right? Because that that number includes feeding 15,000 Nicaraguan children every single day that otherwise would not eat, right? That number includes 15 Ukrainian girls that were in the basement of a house where the guy left and they were between 12 and 18 years old and had a very high risk of getting trafficked when they tried to leave that house. We sent special forces guys in there that called us and asked us to write a check with vans and bulletproof blankets to wrap the girls in to go scoop them out and exit them from the country. And then they got a you know blacked out photo of them all at a halfway house at 15 of 230,000 lives. So you start to listen to some of the stories of what these nonprofits are able to do with the generosity of their donors and man it it fires us up we get so pumped our team doesn't i mean we are always looking at the reports and the you know we just got off of an underwriting call with the mastermind group of how are we analyzing these deals it's like cool i need to analyze this deal because we need to maximize the profit in it so that not only our investors make the best return that they can but that we can give a little bit more to these organizations that need a lot of help. There's no shortage of need in the world. They're doing really good work. How do we fund that work? Like, I'm not going to fly over and go do X, Y, or Z, but we can fund the companies that are doing the, the work. So yeah, it's such an important thing to start to think through, are my investments impacting the world in the way that I want? And this comes up a lot with um, a lot of Wall Street investors that come to us and they start looking at alternative assets like real estate. And they're like, I had a conversation with this one lady. She's a retired pastor, right? And her all of her money was in this 401k from her. And we went through and I was like, do you know what you're invested in? She's like, yeah, I'm in the Vanguard 100 fund. I'm like, cool. She's like, it's returning really well. I'm like, cool. Do you want to know what companies are in the Vanguard 100 fund? And she said, sure. So we looked it up and went through and lo and behold, it's a $18 billion fund or something like that, right? So it holds a lot of different companies in it. But the top 30 holdings were all companies that I would argue are antithetical to her worldview, meaning they promote agendas politically or fund political parties or different agendas that are not lined with her faith. And she had no idea. She almost fell out of her chair. Well, your financial advisor is not going to tell you that. Like, he's not going to say, hey, what are your core values? And let's make sure that the companies we're investing in align with them. It's not his job. So, you know, I think a lot of aha moments come from digging in and going, I now I can't unring the bell. Now it's almost everything that I do has a spotlight on it because of me teaching other people, one, that that is something that they should be looking at. But two, like, man, what is there an alternative Right? Is there an alternative of this company that produces X that this company produces Y? It's a very similar product, but I'd rather buy that product because it aligns with my world or there, you know, which I mean, so once you start to see it, right, and just depends how far you want to take it is, is your investments, your purchases, all of those things, are they aligning? Or at least a percentage of your portfolio. Now you know that, you know, we're saving kids from sex trafficking in, um, you know, in the Philippines, like, so do you know you can get a double digit return while we double digit give to organizations like that? So not only like our monthly statements out to investors say, here's what the finances look like in all the properties. Here's what the nonprofits have done that you helped us fund, right? Like, and it just, it creates impact. If you've listened to our show for any length of time, you've heard us talk about infinite banking and how we were able to use that concept to create over $50,000 a month in passive income. But it's just not that easy to figure out how does this all connect into my own personal system? Stallion, that's why we created the Passive Income Operating System, bro. It shows you how to turn active income into passive income. It makes all the steps come together. If you would like to get access to it as a podcast listener, we've never given this away in public before, go to whatswhatwallstreet.com forward slash P-I-O-S. There was nothing worse than walking into class when you're in school and the teacher saying, pop quiz day, why? Because you were unprepared. Are you unprepared though for financial freedom? Don't be, find out how close you are by taking our 30 second quiz at wealthwithoutwallstreet.com forward slash quiz.
So Stephen, are there other ways, maybe outside of charitable, that maybe the investments that you're making have, can have an impact, even maybe just inside your own family? Yeah, I mean, so I just had this conversation this morning about like, what's the new limit, right, from the accountant that I can pay my kids to work for my business? So that limit is like 15000 I think, this year. So I can pay my kids from the business, and as long as it's not over that threshold of fifteen five, I think it is, it's not taxable, right? There's no tax due to it. So then we take that money, and I did a video um, called uh, Millionaire Kids, and that money now gets invested alongside of us into the fund where I know, based on our rates of return historically, when my daughter, by investing this $15,000, will turn it into a million dollars. And we do that for all the kids, right? So now how do you, I mean, you can take that $15,000 and what we'll do this year is buy additional policies for each of the kids, right? Whole life policies, and then take that and borrow against it and then invest in the fund. So now we have it working in multiple places and it's tax-free to the business because it's a payroll write-off from the business sense. So yeah, I mean, investing in your kids in their future over time and then, you know, the impact that that creates for them is immeasurable. Oh, there's no doubt. Yeah. What you're talking about are today and it gets me fired up because impact is it. I think I'm going to change my middle name to impact. Like that's how, how much I love that word. So much. Impact. I, like I it. mean, just, you know, stallion, I'm going to change it from stallion to impact. Uh, but the, the point is, is you're talking about, man, the world is so much bigger and we have such a much bigger mission than we have just to make money grow right? Money grow, that's one piece of the puzzle. That's being a good steward uh, and taking and, and multiplying dollars. We're called to that. Yeah. But at the same time, you you pointed out that you weren't necessarily called to be the one to go to all these places and be on the front lines, but it was part of God's plan for you to be here growing uh, money the way that you have to support people that are on the front lines. It's, it is a equal calling and you get to be a part of that and i love this because we talk so much about financial freedom on the show and to be honest there's a, an element of that that makes me nervous because some people may get caught up in the idea that financial freedom is what i've always been looking for if i mm -hmm. could just have more passive income than i have monthly expenses everything would be right with the world and the truth of the matter is without spiritual freedom, without seeing that like God has called us into so much more, there's so much more fulfillment when I put my trust in him and subsequently then bought into his mission and his worldview, like there's, there's no way that it can compare with just having financial success. Those things are, have to be coexisting. Otherwise you're going to be left uh, you know, unfulfilled. Yeah. And money only solves money problems. So, you know, we can, we can focus on the passive income and we should, but again, it comes down to the seven layers of why I want to create passive income so that I can, why, what are you looking to do? What's the purpose behind it? Because if that's the goal, you'll be at the finish line going, well, now what? And you'll still be the same unfulfilled person that you were when you started the journey, because that can't be the why that can be the reason that we're doing it. So, you know, and a lot of people, I've gone to enough masterminds where everybody stands up, they do their 10 minute presentation of like, this is what my wins, losses and struggles have been. And everybody starts the slide with a picture of their family. And like, this is my why. Is it? <laughs> exactly. I mean, the great entrepreneurial lie is that we work 80 hours a week so that we can make our family priority while not prioritizing our family. So like, yeah, I know that it's your why. I know that you want to take care of and provide for them. What else? Do you want to show your kids what it looks like to be generous? Do you want to show your kids what it's look what it looks like to love people? Well, cool. How many times how many times in your past life have you heard, I want to make a lot of money so I could go love people? Like my kids understand that theory, right? I haven't heard that a lot where people are going, Yeah, I wanna make a lot of money so that I could go love people better. Like, well, how how do you do that? Well, 
drive around your neighborhood and see somebody's roof who's fallen off. Go to a local church, knock on the door and say, hey, that lady's roof has fallen off. I'm going to pay for it. You're going to go do the donating, right? I don't even want her to know that I did it. Can you go do that, right? Go walk around the Target parking lot and see who needs new tires. I mean, you can love on people when you have a fat check. Mm, no doubt. So talk to us about that. It, it, everything you're saying, people are like, wow, this is really impactful. It, I can see how how I want to be a part of something like this. And so obviously they could donate or they could not donate. They could invest with purpose with you, right? That's one thing they could do. But what are some other practical things you think of that people could take action right now to, to tie uh, this impact with their worldview? Yeah. So um, we use a company called Waterstone to do a donor advised fund. A donor advised fund is simply a giving... Um, strategy. It's a, it's, a, it's a vehicle for giving. So right now, if you're donating to a cause, you're probably writing a check. And at the end of the year, they're going to send you that tax receipt that you file with your taxes. I always lose half of them because it's not highly detailed. Uh, every time. Every, <laughs> every single time. And the, so what this does is, so we have a family donor advice fund and then we have the business donor. Family donor advised fund is where I give to my local church, my tithes, and then offerings, which is over and above that, like wherever we want to donate, you know, Samaritan's Purse, or uh, my kids just wanted to save some gorillas uh, in, in, I think, South Africa or something. And I was like, okay, so, so we get the kids involved in the giving aspect too, right? We'll sit down and say, hey, we have some extra money in the donor advised fund. Where do you want it to go? We're in the process of buying backpacks right now. It's back to school day. So you can start a family donor advised fund and you'll contribute to it. It's a tax write-off immediately when it hits the donor advised fund. And then you make recommendations as to where you want that money to go. So you can choose your organizations. Um, so different donor advised funds have different policies. So just, you know, you can look at a Waterstone as a Christian one. So you would only be able to donate to things that align with those values um, but if right, I'm sure the second, gorillas Christians or how did that work? The gorillas were not against Christian <laughs> values. Oh, they were not. Okay, so we they didn't have to. Okay, I didn't, I didn't know if that was a Christian organization. You know, like you know, gorilla, no. gorillas with scripture memory uh, yeah. dot com they or something like that. The word. They, learned, they learned how to sign. The word. Hey, that, <laughs> be angry and do not sin. You know, but uh, just. Like, that's what I would want to know if I came face to face with the gorilla, you know, be mad at me, but <laughs> oh, you not tear me apart <laughs> for real. So I think that's a very practical step is like you, you can start targeting. And for me, I like it because at the end of the year, I just print out that one tax receipt and it just gives me a grand total of all the giving that we've done. So it's easy to give to the accountant. I don't have to wait for stuff in the mail or lose it or so I think um, practically that's a good way to get involved. It's like with local organizations or whatever, you can just do your giving through that donor advised fund. And then for the business, same thing. We interview new nonprofits every single quarter. We have a quarterly board meeting. We go through the new nonprofits that we're vetting and just make sure that their core values align with our core values. And, you know, I think that's a difficult thing sometimes is there's no shortage of need. I have, I mean, man, we have amazing organizations that are like next up, we haven't started funding them yet because we're still waiting on new closings and new income and whatever, but I'm so excited to start funding them because their their core values are so heavily aligned with ours. So, you know, it's um, being able to vet those organizations. The Donor Advice Fund is, is cool too because they do that. They'll go and check on 501c3 statuses, making sure that all the paperwork is. So they do background checks on all the organizations for you. And then you can um, choose where you want to donate. So <clears throat> I think between that and then just starting to recognize do my investments align right that's kind of the first step is let's go through the core values maybe let's look at there's some cool organizations out there fintech being one of them where you can go to fintech.com uh, you can see where what mutual funds you're invested in and what companies are inside of them oftentimes your financial advisor will just give you the historical rates of return you know and and then ask people like hey if I'm going to invest with your organization, where, where's that going? What are we trying to do here? You know, so like we can still give great returns, but 
are we doing Shrek movie under the stars? Like, is everybody doing that? Probably not. But the economics on that, by the way, are insane. Like having that person there, everybody's like, well, you give away. I actually had one guy say this to me on a call. He was like, you give one of the apartment units to this organization so that they can house somebody there for free. He's like, you guys must be making too much money. And I said, well, the economics on it actually are significantly better with that given away um, unit versus the complexes that we have without it. And it's counterintuitive, right? And a lot of biblical knowledge is. But the culture and community that it creates, the lease turnover reduces by over 50% on all of those properties. People don't leave. Wow. And it's much more expensive to get a new client or a new tenant than it is to keep an old one. So it's, yeah, the economics really work too, but we're also loving on people, which is pretty cool. I love that. So Stephen, uh, thank you again for being willing to come on today and um, being such a, an awesome part of our community and our mastermind. For folks that want to get to know you, um, connect with you in some way outside of our app, I know everyone can get you there. What yep. would you want them to go to learn more? Yeah, investingwithpurpose.org is great. Uh, you can kind of see some of the, all of the nonprofits that we're funding, and you can also see the portfolios that we're having. Um, you know, people always ask, you know, how does that affect my return profile if we invest with you? And it doesn't, it just comes out of our company side. So the limited partners that invest with us, they're not affected, but I, I like to tell people you're not, um, you're not affected financially but we hope that you're affected spiritually because you're really the reason that we can continue to grow and to give to these organizations and, and help people out. Um, that's because of our investors. So then go to that website. I'm on LinkedIn, you know, but catch us on the wealth dot wall street app is probably the easiest. I, have you seen, I've been getting so much better at being on there a lot. Dude, you're just like, um, you're, you're top of the class, bro. I, I appreciate you so much. And, uh, Folks, thank you again for being willing to come on here and invest in yourself. And I pray that this is actually a way for you to expand your horizons on what's possible as you align your core values with how you invest. Um, if you found value today, please rate and review the show. That's how we can continue to get this word out and uh, give people a true path to financial freedom. Thanks again. We'll catch you on the next episode. This has been the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to the show to break free of the Wall Street mindset and begin building wealth on your own terms in places you understand so that your wealth will never run dry. See you next episode.